Welcome to the organic chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we'll be going through questions 16 to 20. So first I'll show you guys the question so you guys can pause and attempt the questions on your own. Here's question 16, question 17, question 18, question 19, and question 20. So now that you guys attempted those questions on your own, let's go through them together. Question 16 is saying an alkene with water will be in equilibrium with the alcohol that results from the hydration of the alkene by the water. With dilute acid and low temperatures, this equilibrium would be driven in which direction? So first of all, we know that there's an equilibrium and we have the equilibrium process that's taking place is hydration of an alkene by water. So what that pretty much looks like is if I have an alkene like this plus water, that goes towards the alcohol. So the way that this takes place is the alkene will, well, it will come and attack a hydrogen, and then later on it'll be a carbocation, and then the oxygen of the water will attack the carbocation to get this alcohol. So the alkene is now hydrated. That's the, that's the hydration reaction. So this is in equilibrium. Let's make the equilibrium arrows. So the main thing that you should know is to help this reaction go along, we need to make our electrophile better. So in the beginning on the left side, you can see that the nucleophile is the alkene and the electrophile is the water. So the way that we can make water a better electrophile is if we have this hydronium instead of just water. And this exists just as the normal equilibrium of water. Water is going to exist between just water as H2O and then hydronium plus OH minus. So this already exists if we just had the alkene sitting around in water. This is what the equilibrium looks like. And then we were told now we have a solution of dilute acid and also low temperature. Which way does this push the reaction? Well, what happened is we added more H plus over here, which means that we increased the amount of this species, the hydronium. So what we ended up doing is increasing the amount of a reactant. To relieve this stress, according to Le Chatelier's principle, the reaction equilibrium is going to shift to the right. So that means that what we're going to get is pushing this reaction towards the side with more alcohol. So B is correct. We're going to go towards the side with the alcohol. We're not going to go to the left, to the reactant side. And C is incorrect, saying that the reaction isn't going to change either way, because adding acid did change the concentration of one of the species. So it did shift the equilibrium. And then D is incorrect saying the favored equilibrium direction, it, it cannot be determined. That's incorrect. We just have to think about the reaction that's taking place, what we know to be the reactants and the products, and then think about what dilute acid actually means. It means we're adding some more H plus, some more protons. So that means that we are changing the amount of reactants that we have. So if we can figure all this out from the question, then we know that according to Le Chatelier's principle, it's going to shift to the product side. In question 17, we're asked how many pi bonds does this compound have? So with any compound, you should know that the bonds between them are made up of sigma bonds. So every single bond I have between these carbons is a sigma bond, which is made from the overlap of the different hybridized orbitals. And then after that, if I have another bond that is made through unhybridized p orbitals coming together and that is a pi bond so we're asked for how many pi bonds all of these are sigma bonds but then over here on the left we have a double bond this first bond that is a sigma bond but then the second bond that is a pi bond over there same thing over here on the right first one we have a sigma bond but then after that we have a pi bond and then the third bond as well is due to unhybridized p orbitals overlapping. So we have here two pi bonds. That means in total, we have three pi bonds in this compound. So when you're looking for pi bonds, make sure you just look for these double bonds if we're talking about a carbon compound. So it's the extra bond, which is a pi bond. Overall, we have three of them. In question 18, we're asked which of the following molecules does not contain a triple bond. So for this, we need to look at these names and be able to know what the structure looks like and then determine whether or not it has a triple bond. 
So a benzene, it looks like a six carbon ring, but we do have we do have some double bonds in there, but we don't have any triple bonds. Therefore, we can just say that A is the correct answer. If you know the structure for benzene, you know that it does not have triple bonds. And let's just go through the other options. So carbon monoxide is one carbon and one oxygen. And there is a triple bond between them. So that's what carbon monoxide looks like. C, nitrogen gas, that's just two nitrogen molecules bonded together. That one also has a triple bond for it to be neutral overall. And finally, D, ethyne, when we have this Y and E as a suffix, that means that we are talking about a triple bond. So it's two carbons with a triple bond between them. So that means B, C, and D, all of those do have a triple bond in their structure, but benzene is the only one which just has double bonds. It doesn't have any triple bonds. In question 19, we're asked which of the following would be expect to, expected to have the highest Ka. So when we say that something has a high Ka, that means that we are saying it is a good acid or a strong acid. That would probably be a better, be a better word. So we're saying it is a strong acid. And then having a high Ka also means that you have a low pK. So those are two ways that you can think about it. But a high Ka means that I'm talking about the acid dissociation constant. So I'm talking about to what extent does this acid dissociate and lose its proton. And if the Ka is high, that means that we have a lot of products, which means we have a lot of protons. And so this acid does tend to dissociate a lot. So which one of these is the strongest acid? Propanol. That would be if I had one, two, three carbons, and then an OH. Butanol is one, two, three, four carbons, and then an OH. One, two, three, four. Two butanol is if I had the OH on the second carbon. And finally, phenol looks like this if I had an aromatic ring and then an OH attached directly to it. And to think about which one of these is the strongest acid, we have to think about the conjugate base that forms, which one of those is the weakest and the most stable, meaning that if I deprotonate this acid and I form the conjugate base, which is the O minus species, which one of those is stable enough that it'll stay around for a little while and not want to attack something and regain its proton and go back to the OH form. So like if I had propanol, it would look like this if it's deprotonated. But the thing is, this conjugate base that we, for, that we formed on the right, it is pretty strong as a base, which means that that O minus does want to go and grab another proton to go back towards the alcohol on the left. And the main thing that you should know for this type of question is that if I take my phenol, and I deprotonate that. Let me just make that a little straighter. If I take my phenol, deprotonate it, and I have an O minus on my phenol, now the negative charge that's been formed on the oxygen in this phenol species, that can come and be donated into the aromatic system. So this negative electron density, it can be donated pretty well into the aromatic system, and it can be distributed, and the charge can be moved around because of the this conjugated system which means now that the oxygen, which doesn't like to have a charge, it can not feel the effects of that negative charge because it's being distributed in the conjugated system. Whereas with all the other aliphatic alcohols, when they get a negative charge, oxygen has this charge, it doesn't want to have a charge, and it can't really distribute a charge in these, these carbon chains. So the, it, its only option really is to go and grab another proton and then get rid of its charge in this way by forming another bond. So because all the aliphatic ones, when they get a negative charge, they can't really keep it around as long. That species is not that stable. Because of that, that means that all of them are weaker acids because they don't want to lose their proton as much. And so the strongest acid is the phenol. So just keep it in mind, a phenol or an alcohol with an aromatic system is more alcoholic, sorry, it's more acidic than 
an aliphatic alcohol. So its pKa for phenyl will be around like 10, which is lower compared to aliphatic ones, which are around 16 or 17. Moving on to question 20, we're asked which of the following is not typically considered an amphipatic molecule. So for something to be amphipatic, that, that means that it has both polar characteristics and non-polar characteristics. So within molecule, it has both of, within one molecule, it has both of these, these groups. So for phospholipids, you should know that they are pretty characteristically amphipatic. So there's a phosphol part and a lipid part. And what they would look like is something generally like this. So if we had a bunch of like long ester chains, so just there are ester chains on all of these. So the main thing that you need to notice is we have this phosphol part over here, that's the phosphol part, and then all of this carbon part, that is the lipid part. So in a phospholipid, we have the phosphate, and the phosphate has these oxygens attached, which have a negative charge. That makes this part of the compound polar, and the rest of the lipid part makes it nonpolar. So it has both a polar region and a nonpolar region, which means phospholipids, they are amphipatic. Alcohols, so what they would look like, so that was A, B, they would look something like this, for example. We have an OH group, that's the polar part, and then we can have an R chain. It can be any length. It could just be one carbon long, but in either case, like we do have some nonpolar region because we have a carbon group attached to the alcohol. Therefore, it is also amphipatic. And then C is not. So in C, we're talking about long chain hydrocarbon and hydrocarbon just means that we have just hydrogens and carbons so in this molecule we don't have any polar group we don't have like a an alcohol a phosphate anything like that we just have carbons and hydrogens therefore the one in option c a long chain hydrocarbon is just non-polar and finally d a fatty acid it looks like if i had a long chain but then also a carboxylic acid at the end so therefore, there is a polar part to this molecule as well. So here, these are the polar parts, and then these are the non-polar parts. But then in option C, we only have a non-polar part. We have no polar part. Therefore, it's not amphipatic. That's it for the questions in this video. If you like what you saw, where we went through different questions and explained all the answer options to you, then make sure to check out our course on teachable.com. The link is in the description below and in the course we go through a lot more questions similar to this and then we also have lessons on all these different topics on the MCAT like organic chemistry, biology, all of those topics in the level that you need to understand it for the MCAT. So make sure to check out our course and that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.